You are the founding member of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, right? The correct way is not the founding member, but A. There was four of us. Uh, Les Thompson called me up and, and said, Hey, John, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, getting this, I'm getting together with this new band that's just forming. you got to come play with us. You know the guys. We're hanging around the Cage Guitar Shop. We're all hanging around the guitar shop in Long Beach. It's got a, a communal table that you'd sit around and drink coffee or tea and eat McDonald's hamburgers, surrounded by folk music records and instruments. And that's where everybody was going after school and more than, more than they should have during school. Um, because Wes at the time was 16 years old. One guy, Jimmy Fadden, was 17, a junior in high school. Well, Wes was a junior, Jimmy was a senior. Jeff Hanna was a first year of college. I was in my second year of college. And um, we just started playing and ended up playing the folk clubs, and it just kind of ambled into existence, 1966. Wow. That's amazing. So you have been, basically, you've been a musician your entire life. Uh, well, not until I was 17 when I started playing. Up until then, I was doing magic and trying to make things and do things. Do you still, do you still dabble in magic? Well, I like to do certain tricks for people and because it really blows them away because they have no idea usually that I can can do some things with cards and stuff. It's a lot of fun, yes, but not necessarily publicly. <laughs> I was just saying because I had I never I don't think I've ever heard that about you. Well, Tell me after working in the Disneyland Magic Shop for three years and doing tricks all day to sell them, you had to be good to keep your job, and I was told I was good. In fact, there was one trick deck of cards called the Swingali deck. One one day I sold a hundred. I held a record for the Swing Dolly Deck sales. Wow. They were $1.56 with tax. Okay, so you mentioned Saturday Night Live, so I'm going to kind of go off, off script here and um, because that's, that's really interesting. I mean, as you know, Saturday Night Live has been around since, boy, I mean, it, it started when I was a teenager um, back in the 70s. Were you, living, were you living in New York in 77? Oh, oh yeah. Remember the huge snowstorm that happened? Yes, the blizzard of '77. <laughs> right, we were we were doing Saturday Night Live that week, and the Dirt Band was on, and Randy Newman and Steve. We did King Cut with them, and and short people with Randy Newman and writers in the range or something. And I am one of those short people. I'm only five foot two. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, when he used to sing that, I used to take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so funny you would say that, too, because as soon as you said Randy Newman, I'm like, short sure, people, in my head, I hear, short sure, people. Oh, that, that, that jerk, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I didn't think of him as a jerk. I really didn't. I mean, it was just, it was, the song got a lot of attention. Um, but I, I bring this up because now, as you know, that Saturday Night, Night Live has a resurgence. Um, because of Alec Baldwin and uh, his impersonation of Donald Trump. Uh, not to get political, but what do you think about that? I mean, do you think, do you feel the resurgence of the show? Because, um, as we all know, I mean, it has had kind of uh, lost viewership, you know, over, I mean, it's been on forever. Well, my situation with Saturday Night Live is I've liked some of it. I've known some of the people that have gone through it and thought they did well when I'd see him. Kevin Nealon's a longtime friend, and uh, I always thought he was good when I'd see him, and I liked the early years, but most of the time I work on Saturday night, so I don't get to see it. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's that's so yeah. true. I, I'm, I married a musician, and um, so through the years I've said to him, do you remember this show or that show? And he's like, well, if it was on a Friday or Saturday night, don't even bother asking me. Because he never saw anything that was on those nights either, because he was always working. Well, you start seeing things like Baldwin's stuff and, and Tina Fey doing Sarah Palin. That was really cool, and uh, I think it's wonderful they do that. Well, I think that you know at, at these at these kind of times, I think you need some levity. You know, you really do. You need so, to be able to laugh at well, something. You, you need it any time. You know, sometimes people comment about how tough things are, but when my youngest son 
watched a special on the 60s. He called me up and said, I didn't realize, Dad, what you lived through. I said, yeah, I know. Talked about some of it. But yeah, churches were burning and, and war was raging and it was an illegal war and some people were going and some weren't and presidents were lying and some things never changed. Everything was, you know, uh, Kennedys were getting shot. Uh, you know, when Robert Kennedy was shot in, at, at the Ambassador Hotel, we played that Ambassador Hotel room, the same room, the next night. No and way. The, tape, the, the yellow tape was in the hallway, and the instructions were, don't go on the other side of the yellow tape. <laughs> oh, my Lord. So you have been in the middle of history. Can you imagine that now? Well, there was a high school prom from four different high schools going on, and we were booked on it, so we played. And, uh, you know, there was all that stuff going on, and, and uh, trying to figure out, if, did you want to talk to a Vietnam vet? Well, it would be a good thing to do that, because they went through things that you just do not understand, John, me, I'm talking to myself. Right. And they didn't... They just wanted to, I, I just celebrate the fact that any time I made a Vietnam bet and say, I'm really glad you got back. I'm glad you're alive, man. How you doing? It was a tough time. I took my boys when I had my, I have six children. And <gasps> Congratulations. <1990, laughs> well, children, they're 36 through 46 now. Mm -hmm. And when I t took my six, uh, I took, uh, just a minute, um, Andrew, no, 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 Jonathan, Ryan, Nathan. Yeah, I took three of them with me on a Father's Day weekend of 1994. So they were 12, uh, they were 12, 14, and 18, 17. And I had three jobs that weekend. And I was, I was weekend with Dad. I was a single father. And I, had, I took my kids to work with me because I want, didn't want to give up a weekend which meant that I spent 80% of the money taking them with me. Right. It didn't matter. And uh, I, I told them, I said, I've got three days on the East Coast. We have to fly into Baltimore and then out of Baltimore. And we'll, the last, and at the last job, which was Norfolk, Virginia area, I said, guys, we have a choice tonight. We either drive back to the Baltimore airport, we get there about 2.30, I'll get a room for us, and we have to get up at 5.30 to catch the plane. And, uh, or we can go to downtown D.C. and look at all the monuments in the middle of the night. And they all wanted to do that. And I wanted to, and I said, I want to take you to the Vietnam Wall. And at 1 in the morning, I parked right next to the Lincoln Memorial. This is pre-9-11, and it was easy to do that. And I said, go talk to those Vietnam vets over there, and I'll meet you at the wall in a half hour. And when I met them at the wall, I was trying to tell them best I could about how they need to keep their eyes and ears open to what's going on in the world because the old men always send young men to fight their wars, and they've never been. The people that vote for the wars never go, or never been. Right. And uh, it just happens that way. Now, you can make your own opinion. I'm not making you the opinion. I'm only stating the way it is. Yeah, you, you're only stating the history. Yeah, when I had my finger on the wall, I said, these guys, these 62,000 guys here, were told to go by a guy named Robert McNamara. And in 1978, he said he thought he made a mistake doing that. So the mistake he made, you can read the names on these walls, and one of my boys says, Dad, look at the name your finger's on. And my finger was on the last name McEwen, M-C-E-U-E-N. Oh, wow. I went, I, I, it, it really shook me, and I went to the book that's there, and I looked it up, and sure enough, and I was a sophomore in, uh, no, a junior, what was, no, I was a, when I was a senior in high school, I'd gotten this draft notice with my name on it. And I thought, I haven't even done my physical. Why am I getting a draft notice? I opened it up, and it was this other guy. He was, he was two years older than me. And, oh, he was two blocks away, and I took that draft notice and handed it to his mother. <gasps> and he ended up on the wall? And now he's on the wall. Oh, Oops. my God, John. Uh, you know? And uh, that really, that really uh, shocked them. <laughs> I, 
I was going to say that's, and that had to be, and obviously it affected you because you've held on to this story your entire, you know, since, when when did you say it was, the 1990s, when you found out? This was 90, it was 94. Wow. And uh, things like that are good to pay attention to, you know, and I don't know what that has to do with making made, made in Brooklyn, but all these kinds of experiences, as I felt, came together in that studio with all these players, because everybody involved has had extensive lives in music. You know, Martha Redbone, what a wonderful career she has. And I asked her to do a William Blake song that William Blake, the British poet, wrote the words for in 1806, and we wrote the music for her. and I rose up, and that was so much fun. And... and it was very similar to the Will the Circle Be Unbroken album in that in the studio there were no politics, there was nothing other than let's make this music as good as we can. Right, and you also, you know, I see Skip Ward play bass. Skip Ward is a very difficult guy to work with because he never makes a mistake. <laughs> I was going to say... Uh... We are recording this, and it's going to be on YouTube. <laughs> but then you gave him a compliment. He joined the rest of us and screw up once. During the rehearsal, it would be fine. <laughs> he plays every song like he wrote it. That's so funny. And, and um, okay, and you've got Matt. Matt is, um, vo okay, so Matt did vocals. Yes, Let's see, Matt. guitar and mandolin. Yeah, Matt Carnsonis plays mandolin and guitar and sings a couple of the songs. And... He is uh, just a wonderful guy I ran into 30 years ago. I was playing in Phoenix with the Dirt Band, and I went up in the mountains to some bar and sat in with a group that was playing, and it was a match group. Oh, wow. We got to know each other. And we were playing in a bar band, and he's been in the Austin Lounge Wizards. He's played with people like Wendy Waldman, and, and he does film scoring music, and he's a multi-talented guy. And uh, we've played together for the last 20 years or so. And, uh, when I'm away from the dirt pan. Right, and I think um, and you had Andy Gosling, did uh, clarinet and Andy sax. Gosling, are you familiar with him? Um, the name is very familiar. Oh, have you heard of a band called Railroad Earth? I actually have. I, I don't know a whole... I have heard of them. I don't know a whole bunch of, about them. You want to tell me? Well, Ra Railroad Earth is a jam band by definition, and they sell out two days at Red Rocks. They play festivals. They're like kind of a, a, a few years older than Fish at that type of genre. And they have quite a following. And oh, about five years ago, I got this email from a guy in New Jersey that said, hey, I see you're playing in, uh, in, New York, in Manhattan and want me to come sit in? And I wrote back, well, what do you play? And he sent me back a list of instruments. And I just basically said, well, don't bring the zither. Uh, but he brought clarinet, sax, dobro, mandolin, guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he's equally good on every one of them. And we started playing together. I, I probably did 20, 20 gigs that he came and sat in on. Wow. I told him, I said, you know, I'd love to make an album with you and use all of your instruments, even the zither. <laughs> That's amazing, and I think there's just one. There's just one more person I believe we didn't mention, and that is David. David Bromberg. No, um, David. Oh no, oh David Amram. Right, he's the only one that we didn't mention so far that uh, participated in this album. So we want to get a mention in about him. Um, I've been playing. I've been playing with David Amram now for probably the. Let me think. Probably the last seventeen years. Wow. I'm ninety-eight. I think was the first time. So almost twenty years, and he's the, uh, eighty-six years old, and is is more like a teenager than most teenagers I know. He's got such a great spirit about him. He does everything, and for your listeners, all I can say is about David Amram. Just go Google when you have a, at least a half an hour, and you want to find out about somebody. Go Google David Amram, A M R A M, to see what a wonderful career he's had. His music was conducted by Leonard Bernstein at Carnegie Hall. He sits in with Willie Nelson, 
and uh, he was a best friend of Pete Seeger. He was at Pete Seeger's deathbed, and he uh, toured to Cuba with Dizzy Gillespie in the 50s. He was Jack Kerouac's friend. Wow. And um, Amram plays anything like uh, flute and uh, Egyptian flutes and penny whistle and piano. He's a great jazz pianist. We didn't use piano on this album, uh, but we used his percussion and his flutes and penny whistle. And Amram's the kind of guy, you just look at him when you want him to solo, and he's right there. And... It's so cool. <laughs> so, so I'll tell you what guess, what um, made in Brooklyn in talking about um, your your life experiences and the Vietnam Wall. You know, all of your life experiences and all of the people that you've met along the way led you to Made in Brooklyn. That's how it's all connected. Well, that's interesting. Yes, I think, I th and I think we are all connected. That's why I invited this particular group of people because. Most of them had heard of each other, but only maybe two of them had met each other. Andy Gessling had met Martha Redbone, and Martha Redbone knew David Amram, mm -hmm. but she didn't know David Bromberg. And David Bromberg had played with Jay Unger, but Jay had never met Andy Gessling, you know, and they all had these little different lines of connections that all came together in Brooklyn along with their immense experience and willingness to jump in. And it was really fun. Like, I had fun. I'd always wanted to make an album with David Bromberg since I met him in the 70s. And I finally could say, We're, let's do this album together. And then I could say on, the, on She Dark the Sun, I told John Cowan, and I told him, I got the date, can you make it? Yeah, I can make it. You probably want me to sing that song. Well, I wanted to sing a song that Bernie Ledden had written with Gene Clark before the Eagles started, before Bernie started up the Eagles. Uh, she Dark the Sun. It's a song that very few people have recorded because it's really hard to sing. But I knew Cowan could kill it. And I said, yep, that's the one. Just let us know the key. And then we got around to recording. I said to Bromberg, David, I really need you to play one of those guitar solos that would make me, at 20 years old, run out to buy the album just because of that solo. Wow. I think he did. Uh, he really, uh, he nailed it. And and uh, with all this combination, you've got a beautiful, You got it's a masterpiece. It really is a masterpiece. Do um, you want to tell the listeners where they can find Made in Brooklyn? I got some in my car. No, stop. Oh, jeez, are you kidding me? <laughs> Do you hear that? Yes, they can, they can be found on uh, Amazon. It would be great if people uh, checked it out on Amazon. 98% uh, five-star reviews, and there's a couple people that hate it, and they're fun to read about. <laughs> but uh, I like everybody can't agree with everything. Right. Like, I like that though. I have I have some in the trunk of my car. Um, all right. So Amazon and, and what about your website? Well, I don't sell them on my website, but Chesky Records does, and HD. That's like in high definition. HD tracks uh, sells them. And basically, if you just Google John Nitty Gritty dot com, uh, John Nitty Gritty, it will take you to my website. Or check out my Facebook, which is John McEwen Music Facebook page. And again, they're on Amazon and iTunes. And you know what's really cool about this nowadays? It's just, it's just a shock to go into my kitchen and say, Alexa, play Excitable Boy by John McEwen on Made of Brooklyn. And then it comes up. So you just did an Alexa commercial. <laughs> No, maybe it, maybe they'll call you. Maybe Amazon will call you. It's it's really fun about Alexa. Who is John McKellen? A John McKellen is a folk musician that plays guitar and banjo, and, and you know it's really funny. That's got to be pretty. That's got to be pretty cool. It's really cool. <laughs> I was eighteen years old in Orange County, California, playing the banjo, trying to figure out if 
going to get me out of town. <laughs> Trying to figure out what you were going to do with your life, and now you've got an electronic device who tells you who you are in your kitchen when you ask her. <laughs> well, when I was 18, I saw a group called the Dillards. And when I saw the Dillards, I knew what I wanted to do with my life, which was play music and go on the road. And uh, they gave me that direction. And thank you, Douglas and Rodney. And but I didn't, I didn't think it would go into the places it has. I'm, I can't believe some of the places I've been, Donna, are the people I've spent time with. I mean, when, when the Dirt Band broke up after we did Paint Your Wagon in 1968, we were in the movie Paint Your Wagon with Lee Marvin and Clint Eastwood. And after four months of, on the set filming in Oregon, everybody was kind of tired of being in a band. And we just kind of fizzled out. Six months later, Jeff and I got back together and said, let's put the band back together. We had no idea that things were going to happen like they did. Like, we'd end up playing Farm Aid, was backing up John Denver, because John Denver wasn't even, a, he was still John Dishendorf. Right. You know? We played the first Farm Aid. We backed up John Denver, then did five of our own songs. And we played three other Farm Aids also. We didn't know we'd be the first American band to Russia or make an album called Will the Circle Be Unbroken? It's in the, it's in the Library of Congress. My oh. gosh. It's also in the Grammy Hall of Fame. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's just... Actually, when we got back together, Jeff said, I heard a song when we were rehearsing. We rehearsed 10 hours a day, six days a week for the Uncle Charlie album, which was our fifth album. And Jeff came in one day and said, I heard a song on the radio. I think it's just right for me. It's about a guy with a dead dog. And, uh, oh, okay, Mr. Well, Bojangles. It was Mr. Bojangles. Mm -hmm. And that song ended up on the radio for 36 weeks. Wow. And when the record company told us they were going to release it as a single, we thought our career was over. We, <laughs> you, can't, you can't put out a song in three, four time about a guy with a dead dog that's four minutes long. Yeah. You know? <laughs> You have had an amazing career, and you're still going. Um, do you want to tell everybody where you where they can see you next? If people are looking for a place to see me, uh, I'm really be glad to see you too. But um, at the end of February, I'll be in Seattle, the Bel Bellevue, Washington, at the Wintergrass Festival. That's at the 24th and 5th. That's going to be very cool. Then the next weekend, I'm out in North Carolina with the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band doing some of our 50th year stuff. And there's a bunch of Dirt Band dates in March. But April 8th, I'll be in Park City at the Eccles Center. with my, I mentioned Wes Thompson earlier, an original Dirt Band member, and John Cable, a guy that was in the band in the 70s, and Matt Tarsonis will be playing at the Eccles Center in Park City, a beautiful concert hall. And there's more dates on the calendar, and you can find them if I hope you look for Well, I want to thank you so much for sitting sitting in and talking with us today. This has been so much fun. You, you are, you're really cool, and you have had such an incredible oh. journey. And you still got many, many, uh, many more miles left, so we look forward to hearing your, your new creations, the, the music you've yet to create. We look forward to hearing that. Well, thank you. I, I look forward to more people finding out about the Maiden Brooklyn album. It's, I've been told it's the best thing I've made in years and years. Again, because of the wonderful people that are on it. They all put out more than they're just a wonderful mind to put that out.